you very much. Thanks, Liam. Very kind words again. Uh, introduction. So uh, I'm going to focus in this talk actually on my book on uh, called The Perils of Perception and uh, about people's misperceptions, why we're wrong about nearly everything. Uh, it's not directly linked to the work package apart from the point of view that it's focused on surveys. Uh, so but I'm going to start with a question for you. There's lots of questions for you in this actually, uh, so there's a bit of participation. Um, but the first one's got very little to do with the content of the book or the work package, but it's still relevant in some ways, uh, as I'll try to explain. So is the Great Wall of China visible from outer space with the naked eye? Can you just put your hands up if you think yes, it is visible from outer space with the naked eye? Outer space, we did define outer space. <laughs> so this is a trouble presenting this to a room full of uh, scientific experts. <clears throat> Always happens when you've got expert audiences. We did define it for people in there, so it's kind of it's uh, beyond uh, high Earth orbit is uh, the, the definition. Is it visible from outer space? Okay, certainly been told so. Well, I'm free. That was a very small number of people saying yes. Uh, it isn't visible from outer space. Sorry. <laughs> but don't feel bad if you did think it was, because 50% of people believe it is. Oh, my slides have gone a bit funny on this. We'll see if it works. Uh, are you allowed to say you don't know? You are in these surveys, but yes, absolutely, you are. Um, we'll see whether this causes a problem with the slides because they've gone a bit uh, funny in translation, but I can tell you what's on them. So uh, so when you think about it a bit more, it's uh, the fact that it, the thought that it would be visible out space is slightly ridiculous in some ways because it's only nine metres wide at its widest kind of points, which is about the same size as a regular house. It's not very, uh, it's not, it, it is incredibly large, um, but it's not, it's, it's its length that gives it that property not its width, not something that would make it visible from outer space. So the reason that I start with this in the book and in presentations is it kind of illustrates four or five points that I think are relevant to our misperceptions. First, there is an element of fast thinking in a Kahneman type uh, way where it's very system one, it's a trivial question, you don't give it much thought, you don't really engage those types of things. You haven't researched it in the way that I did to make sure it's correct. About this time, people start Googling it actually, usually in, in presentations to check. Uh, we mix scales, like I say, it's very, it is one of the largest man-made structures on Earth, but it's its length that gives it that property, not its width. So as humans, we tend to mix scales when we're thinking about the, the size of things. There's something called illusory truth bias, which is where you hear things for the second and third time, you're more likely to believe them, even if they're not true, shown in lots of different experiments, kind of very simple effects about the human brain but one that has huge consequences because that is why people repeat lies over and over again because you are more likely to be effective over time. Uh, there is an element though, this is kind of really important and links to Jose's point and others, is in some ways we want it to be true. It's more emotional than it might seem. It's quite an interesting, uh, impressive fact that man and women can build stuff that might be visible from outer space. So there's more emotional connection uh, that, than you think. But then uh, final point, the more optimistic point that really relates to David's points in some ways is that uh, when you tell people that it's not visible from outer space, uh, they usually change their minds. Uh, did you change your mind? Do you believe me that it is not visible from outer space? A bit of shrugging, but mostly people, <laughs> mostly people change uh, their minds. So we, we are capable of updating our views on things. This is a trivial example, but it does apply in other uh, contexts too. Like I say, that's not particularly what the focus of the studies that I'm going to talk about, a series of studies, uh, the perils of perception studies, it's not really what they're focused on. They're, they're based on over 100,000 interviews that we conducted over about 15 years uh, across up to 40 countries in the, the largest studies. And it's really simple. We get people to guess the reality for their country on a whole range of different things, and then we compare it with the actual reality and look at the gaps uh, between the two. It covers everything from uh, murder, uh, immigration, vaccine safety, obesity levels, murder rates, happiness, sex, or loads and loads of different uh, kind of subjects. And what, uh, what it shows across all of those subjects is that we're often incredibly wrong about them. People's estimates, average estimates are incredibly wrong, which raises the question of why, uh, and then that raises a question of what can we do about it, if anything. Um, uh, and uh, that kind of consistency of error across subjects, across um, uh, country, across time, 
suggests that it's probably due to a wide range of causes, not one thing. And in, in the book and in the way that I think about it, I very, very simply uh, break it down into two, uh, how we think two big buckets, how we think and what we're told. Uh, both of those things being important to how people uh, come to these incorrect views of the world. So on uh, the uh, what we're told side of things, we've got things like our, our own experience, then a whole mess of gaggle of things, as we've kind of heard from Jose, about media, social media, and politics are kind of interact as a whole series of things there that interact together. Um, then we've got uh, a really interesting uh, a concept called rational ignorance, which comes from American uh, tradition of academia, uh, about the, the fact that it actually costs you time and effort to inform yourselves about these things. It's not worth it, so people don't bother. Uh, but the main thing I'm going to focus on is biases, heuristics, um, uh, and uh, we won't, probably won't talk about psychophysics, but we can cover that in uh, conversation. It's an interesting element to this. And then, you, obviously, at, at one end, you've got maths and statistical literacy, just the, the ability, how much we struggle with um, uh, numbers generally, which, again, I won't focus on massively here, but we did uh, in the studies. Um, so um, the best way to do this, best way to understand it is... Um, to just ask you the questions. Um, so this is one example uh, of the typical question of what percentage of women and girls aged 15 to 19 in your country do you think give birth each year? We didn't actually ask this in Ireland, but I have looked up the actual figure for Ireland uh, last night. So you can answer, I know this is a very international audience, so you can answer uh, for Ireland or you can answer for your own country because actually there's not much difference, to be honest, in the actual rate. So just shout out, what do you think? What percentage of women and girls age 15 to 19 in Ireland or Britain or whatever, uh, do you think give birth each year? Don't be shy, just shout out loud and proud. Six, one, six, one, five, two, less than one, less than one. Very well done to the person who said less than one for Ireland. It's 0.8% uh, across these different countries. Netherlands, 0.4. Uh, 1.4 in Britain, 2 goes up to 6% in Argentina, uh, a bigger issue there. But across all these countries, and there was about, this is only a selection, there was about 30 in this particular study, uh, it's only 2% across. So it's a rare, a rare occurrence, teenage birth. So you, you did very well in terms of your guesses, much better than the public, whose average guesses were these, uh, giving these enormous gaps in uh, perceptions. So in Britain... Uh, just taking Britain as an example, so 19% was the average guess. Um, so that's one in five. One in five teenage girls uh, giving birth each uh, year. So in an all-girl class of 30, that would be six baby showers every, every single uh, year. Uh, so obviously, ludicrous again when you think about it a bit more. So why are people so wrong? So first of all, it's, there's an element of vivid emotional stories that we remember. Uh, there is a lot of coverage of those types of stories that there has been, at least historically, in the media, uh, because the media knows that we like those types of unusual, vivid, emotional stories. So they overrepresent them, but we also uh, retain them more than the boring stories. Uh, because we like them, the media give them uh, to us, give us more of those types of stories. So I guarantee you'll never see a headline in any newspaper. Uh, like this, um, because editors don't want to run them because we don't want to read them. So there is a, a systemic element to this where one reinforces the other. Our biases give us the media that we deserve in some sorts of ways. This is related to one of the key concepts of explaining our misperceptions, which is emotional enumeracy. <clears throat> Very simple uh, concept. Um, it just means that we overestimate what we worry about as much as worrying about what we overestimate. So cause and effect run in both directions. If we think something's a big issue, we overestimate it in our minds as much as uh, <coughs> think when we think something's big, we worry about it. So it kind of those things interact. Um, so from my perspective, as a kind of survey uh, geek, um, it makes uh, misperceptions really useful indicators. It's got this useful side effect. Misperceptions are useful indicators of what we're really worried about because it's kind of more direct 
in some ways, more unconscious than uh, asking people whether they're worried about something. You get people to estimate stuff, and it gives you an idea of what they're concerned about. But obviously, it has vital implications uh, from a broader policy and communications point of view is obviously you can't just use facts. It gives me, what I find emotionally numeracy useful for as a concept is it gives you a framework to understand why uh, simplistic myth busting doesn't work um, because it misdiagnoses part of the issue. It's partly emotional, people's misperceptions or, or wrong views of the world. It's partly emotional, so myth busting is seldom the full answer, but we'll come back to that. Um, we're also useless at spotting, second, there's a second effect with this, which is uh, very much in the Steven Pinker, Max Rosa, um, uh, Hans Rosling uh, kind of group, is we're useless as, as human beings. We're useless at spotting slow positive changes. So this ooh, is the trend, sort of most of the trend, <laughs> of uh, um, uh, decline in teenage uh, births across, this is America, across different ethnic, ethnic groups in America. Uh, those lines would uh, usually all be there going all the way down. It's, it's a halving or more of the levels, the rates of teenage pregnancy in, um, in America b between 1990 and current. But it's the same pattern across just about every country, massive declines in teenage birth rates. But we don't really spot that. We don't see that, partly, again, because it's not the sort of thing that the media cover. There is uh, not much incentive to, to, to cover these small incremental improvements. Uh, instead of that uh, small incremental improvements, we tend to, and the media tend to, focus on negative um, information. And there's lots and lots of great experiments and lots more expert people in the room than me uh, that show uh, how that works. Um, so uh, the late, great John Cassiopo of Chicago University uh, ran a whole series of experiments where he would wire people up to MRI scanners to measure brain activity and uh, show them different images that they had uh, tested as positive and negative to, to see how the brain worked and where it lit up and the intensity to which it lit up. So uh, in America, the positive images uh, were things like pizza. pizza. Pizza and Ferraris were the types of positive images that John Cassiopo used, and the negative images were things like uh, mutilated faces and dead cats that he showed to people. Um, usually, at this point, the audience kind of take a little bit of a gasp, but you're too hard and uh, scientific <laughs> to, <laughs> to do that. Uh, so, but just in case, because when, when I looked at all the images, I had to look at lots of images of dead cats for this presentation, and this was the least offensive one <laughs> that I could find, uh, because I really didn't want to show those types of images in a presentation because it, they are quite disturbing and it would be the only thing you remember. I would be the dead cat guy showing you pictures of dead cats. So do remember that that cat is just resting. That, that cat is definitely not dead. Uh, don't, don't only remember that from the presentation. So there is a key implication from all of this, um, which is that things are mostly not as bad as we think, uh, literally. Um, there is an element of, because of that focus on negative, it's literally not as bad as we think. It's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, there is a kind of, uh, this is based on a presentation that I did at Judge Business School <clears throat> from a, to a, a group of Dutch, uh, from the Netherlands leaders, business leaders and things. And there is an element which leaders face a tough time getting good news to stick as a result of this. So there is, there is an element of that too. It's much easier to, um, increase fears than decrease them um, among people. We'll come back to that actually on this question. So <clears throat> second question for you is, uh, do you think that the murder rate in your country is higher, lower, about the same as it was in 2000? I've only put up Britain and the average across these countries, but it's kind of pretty consistent again. Higher, lower, or about the same? Just shout out for Britain, lower. Lower or the same, but nearly all lower. Very good. It is uh, lower, uh, minus 29% uh, over that kind of period for Britain. Coincidentally, minus 29% uh, across all of the 30 countries that we asked uh, this in. But again, that's not the perception. The blue bar is uh, lower. The red bar is higher. So you've got, um, well, across the 30 countries as a whole, you've got nearly half of people thinking that the murder rate is higher and only 15% of people thinking um, that it's lower. Uh, so we've got this sense of not only do we focus on negative information, but we also think things are going downhill. 
um, that things are getting worse. So we, we tend to think things are getting worse. And the social psychology uh, name for that is rosy retrospection, is um, how it's kind of talked about a lot. And again, another great US um, experimental psychologist, um, uh, Terence Mitchell, uh, explored this in a much nicer way in some ways. What he did and his team did was uh, interview people before their vacations, before they went on holiday, then during their vacation and then after it when they came back and then he kept interviewing them. Um, so, and what they uh, tried to explore was how people felt about it. Uh, and what was quite reassuring is people go in the same sort of average um, kind of wave on this. So we go from in excited anticipation um, before we go, uh, then we tend to uh, come across the reality of minor niggles when we're on holiday. It doesn't quite go to plan. Uh, things don't work quite as smoothly as uh, we think. And we tend to return with a mild sense of disappointment um, when we're back, uh, not just at being back, but about the holiday itself. But that wasn't the purpose of his experiment. The purpose of his experiment was to keep interviewing people for a long time afterwards. And again, what he found that was on average, um, the memory grows fonder the longer we are away from the holiday. Um, and the mechanism that they were identifying was that people were literally forgetting the bad bits. So they would forget the kids being sick in the car and they would just remember the lovely walks on the beach. And, and they put those sorts of things uh, behind them. So, and, you know, their points are that it's not a dumb fault of our brain. It's actually quite good to let go of those bad things, those small bad things for our own psychological health. But it has a downside, which is that rosy retrospection point is we think the past was better than it was. So we think the present and future are worse or scarier than they really are. Um, because of that effect. So and you can see that and politicians use this a lot. Um, so in, as you can imagine, in a book on misperceptions, Donald Trump features quite frequently in the book. Um, so he said about seven or eight times on the campaign trail in 2016 that the murder rate in our country is the highest it's been in 47 years, right? You won't hear the press saying that. And there was a very good reason <laughs> you wouldn't hear the press saying that, is it's just not true, not at all true. It's about half the level. Um, what he was picking on was there was a small uptick, uh, well, a big uptick year on year in American cities, but it was still like a little, uh, on the long-term trend line, it was like a little blip in the long-term trend line. He was picking up on that and exploiting it. Um, and that is, does play to our sense that it's all going wrong um, in many ways. And this is a question very simply just ask uh, whether the world is getting better or worse across uh, different countries where... Uh, Worse is in red, um, and better is in uh, green. Uh, and just enormous, enormous sense of pessimism about how the world is going, particularly in poor Belgium yeah. here, which is... Uh, any Belgians in the house? Belgians in the house? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you did look quite sad. 3% uh, of Belgians. Uh, Hans Rosling's country, uh, Sweden, actually more optimistic um, in some ways. And there is some evidence that Hans Rosling's uh, work actually had some impact in um, improving people's reality-based view and being less pessimistic about uh, some things. But across, across the board, we think things are getting worse. So those effects, I've only got one or two more effects to go through, uh, are fairly neutral in some ways. But just picking up on Jose's point um, in, in other ways, uh, they're more directionally motivated. Uh, so uh, we asked this question in across countries, but I'm just picking on the US as an interesting example. So in the USA, do you think more people are killed by guns, knives, or other violence? And this is a good test to see how you're thinking, actually. So uh, guns, knives, or other violence. This is intrapersonal violent death, not suicides. So it was all sort of described in the question, but... Shout louder. Come on, what's the... Guns. Guns, other violence. Guns and other violence. It's really interesting. We'll come back to that in a sec. But it is, in fact, uh, guns, firearms. This comes up. Yep, firearms. Uh, and overall, uh, so in, in the US, it's 68% um, uh, of interpersonal violent deaths are caused by guns, second only in the world from the 40-odd that we asked this in uh, to Mexico, where it's 76% of... Uh, Interpersonal violent deaths are caused by guns. And overall, 59% of 
of Americans picked out guns. And I thought that was a bit low, to be honest, because I thought the coverage was going to be uh, uh, stronger in the US about gun deaths. Uh, but the reason it's 59% is because it's this, it's a balance of this, um, where you've got 83% of people who strongly identify as Democrats picking out firearms, and 27% of those who are uh, strongly identify as Republicans, only 27% of strong Republicans picking out um, firearms. So this is the same social reality seen entirely differently depending on your pre-existing political identities. So different, entirely different view, same reality depending on your values, identity, political association in um, this case. So this is the point that our misperceptions are not just neutral about biases and heuristics, they are directionally motivated. So this is the collection of effects of confirmation bias, disconfirmation bias, all of those types of uh, effects typically uh, now talked about in terms of di directionally motivated reasoning uh, that people have. And uh, a massive, massive effect um, on how we view the world. I'm not going to go into Brexit <laughs> too much. We've asked lots of questions around Brexit about directionally motivated reason. But just to show uh, one around, do you believe the claims that the UK sends £350 million per week to the EU, which, you know, the uh, UK Statistics Authority twice, or and maybe even three times now, has said it's a misuse of statistics. But that's, in some ways, that's not the point. The point is... Um, the different views of that, uh, uh, depending on your leave or remain identity, that cut across political identity. So conservative leavers and labour leavers just as likely to believe that is true. A bit of difference between conservative uh, remainers and labour remainers. But this is one of the indicators of how important and strong your leave and remain identity has uh, become. Uh, there's a second, I will do, do an, another uh, aspect to this, how we see reality. Really interesting work starting to come out in the US and in the UK about pluralistic ignorance. So this is our view of what other people think um, and our incorrect views of what other people uh, think. So we asked in Britain, uh, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the NHS is crucial to, to British society and we must do everything we can to maintain it. Um, and it's like a religion, in, as you would know, in, in the UK. It is like the closest thing to, that we have to a, a national religion is, is how people... So you can see 90% of whether you're a uh, Labour supporter, Remain supporter, Leave supporter, Conservative supporter, everyone thinks that is correct. But that's what we did then, is we asked people on the other side their views of each of these groups. So, um, and that comes up with a, quite a different pattern. So you've got non-Labour supporters... Uh, views of Labour supporters, views of the NHS. So that's quite close. People do recognise that Labour supporters are very in favour of the NHS. They do recognise that Remainers um, are in uh, support of the NHS. But the bigger gaps for uh, Leavers and Conservatives. So Conservatives, taking that as an example, are nearly just about exactly the same level of commitment to the NHS, but non-conservatives don't think they do have that commitment, or fewer non-conservatives think they do have that commitment. So we caricature, caricature the other side and misunderstand uh, their views and what they think about these big issues. And this is, this is a key point of a lot of our work on polarisation, is actually we're not that divided on lots of the issues. People are not that different on the issues, but we think the other side think differently to how they really do. And we don't think a lot about their character. We're not very positive about the other side's character. Again, you can see exactly the same sorts of questions in uh, the US between Republicans and Democrats, but this is between Leave and Remainers. So Leavers think their side is intelligent, open-minded and honest. Remainers think their side is intelligent, open-minded and honest, but don't think the other uh, side is. So all these positive attributes apply only or mostly to our side, but not the other side. And then the negative ones is the opposite. So we think, uh, leavers think that Remainers are selfish, hypocritical, close-minded, and exactly the same the other way around for uh, uh, the Remainers, the views of the other side. So one of the things that we want to do in some ways in this, and more broadly in our work, is uh, where I think misperceptions are really important is where it links to models of polarisation. Um, we did a big review of existing models and evidence of polarisation in Britain and uh, the US and then Europe. Uh, and I think it's really helpful, it's helped us at least, to have these polarisation models in mind. And a colleague, Kirsty, uh, worked on this uh, with me, who's also involved in this work 
package. Uh, and one of the things that we found most helpful is to have really clear in our minds the distinction between issue polarisation and effective polarisation. So issue polarisation is what a lot of people think of when they're talking about polarisation, where people are either dispersing on the issues, disagreeing on the issues, and you've got a more extreme view at either ends, or bimodality, which is you break into two big groups on issues, and they kind of drift apart over time. That's the kind of classic view of it from Republicans and Democrats. And then you've got conflict extension, which is where uh, polarization starts on one issue, but then it bleeds into another issue, and it kind of grows like that until you've got a big consortium of issues that all come together and separate people, particularly when the issues are very salient, uh, when they're important to people. This is where polarization really matters, and that's why Brexit um, has been such a, a, a key dividing line for us, because it mattered quite a lot. But what we find is that quite a lot, there's a lot of contention about whether people are actually polarizing on lots of the issues, and I think that is fair. Where there's more clear-cut issue of separation is effective polarization. So this is where it really does relate to trust. Um, uh, so when individuals begin to segregate themselves socially and to distrust and dislike people from the opposing side, irrespective of whether they disagree or not. You can be effectively polarised without not disagreeing on the issues. Um, and these are things like identification with your group, differentiation of the other group, and perception bias, a perceptual bias. And these, these are kind of Sarah Hobolt's um, uh, categorisations, but I think they're really useful for us to think about where does misperceptions fit into both effective polarisation and then where does trust, how does trust and distrust uh, feed into that. So these kind of models, it gives us a bit of a framework to understand where, how does all this uh, fit together. Uh, final section on uh, things. Um, our misperceptions are not a new crisis. I mentioned that rational ignorance tradition in the US or political ignorance. Um, and that was, that's really useful tradition because they had surveys going back to 1940s, 1950s America where they asked people uh, about their uh, understanding or knowledge of fairly similar issues to the ones that I've asked about. And what that shows is that people were just as wrong back then as we are now in many ways. It doesn't show a massive difference. They haven't asked quite the sorts of questions we asked, but some of them they have, unemployment, immigration levels, uh, those types of things. So while there's a temptation to think it's all about alternative facts, that this is a completely new post-truth age, um, uh, fake news is dominating lots and lots of things, actually that type of misperception was uh, is very, very long um, standing. So we need to be careful not to say that this is brand new and uh, it's driven entirely by those types of things. Uh, but there are dangers, and I won't spend long on this because Jose did a much better job than me, but there is uh, an element of our online life and reality being in contradiction in some way. So that's not just things, that's not, disin not just disinformation, um, deliberate disinformation, but it is important when the Russian Minister of Defense says information is another type of armed forces. That is uh, an important element uh, to this, but it's much broader than information disorder, or fake news is those twin effects of uh, our own filtering of our world and then unseen algorithms that do it for us because more time on the platform equals uh, more cash and the way i like to think about it in some ways is that survey we know surveillance is the business model of the internet but that means that confirmation bias is its currency that is kind of literally how the system uh, works so in some ways, for me, even though I've done a lot on misperceptions, uh, the thing that I'm looking at and concerned about is not so much whether we're getting more wrong. Um, it's not, that's not really uh, the issue. It's whether we're getting more certain in our views and that the other side is wrong um, on things. And that's kind of where the worry is, that polarization of how we see it differently from our in-group to our out-group. Um, I did want to just touch on uh, trust directly, and I know this, this is very simplistic given we're going to be looking at this in a, in a lot of detail, but we're always sure that there's a new crisis of trust. When I do conference presentations, it's my most asked for presentation of, uh, for every single industry. Uh, we we'll always think that they uniquely have a new crisis of trust, and you have to go and tell them, talk to them about it, and you'll have done, all of you in here will have done the same or much more. Um, but that is the perception. We asked this question just very deliberately on that. Do you think the average person in the country trusts politicians to tell the truth more or less or about the same amount as they did uh, 
uh, 30 years ago of the general public. Um, and it's just a big sea of red, uh, mostly, when people say less. So uh, the perception is trust is declining, not unlike the rosy retrospection point that very strongly that trust is uh, declining. Britain is in there, not one of the worst, but 68%, um, uh, two thirds of people thinking um, it is uh, declining. And just looking ahead to my next slide, I don't think this one has come out. No, you're going to struggle to interpret that. But what it actually shows is the red along the bottom is politicians. Um, and it goes all the way back to 1983 at more or less the same level of distrust. There is there was never a golden age of trust in politicians. They kind of fight it out between journalists and politicians to be the least trusted uh, 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 profession in Britain. Politicians are slightly winning now. Sometimes it's journalists, sometimes it's politicians. It doesn't really matter. Uh, what you also you can't see particularly well here is that civil servants have gone shooting up in Britain over the years. They have doubled, more than doubled, the level of trust. So the sort of uh, scientists also gone up. The only one that's gone down significantly in the whole of this is the clergy um, in, uh, uh, in Britain, at least. Um, the point here is not saying that this, this is a very simple question on trust to tell the truth. We are going to be obviously looking at more sophisticated ways in which to measure this. The point was we asked this very deliberately to compare it to people's perceptions of it. So there is a very clear view that as 68% of people think it's declined, the reality is it hasn't particularly uh, declined on this type of measure, which we did specify in the question. So final section, is there anything we can do about our biased views? Um, it doesn't look hopeful when you start off, when you get Daniel Kahneman, who studied this and knows more about this, uh, saying, I've been studying this stuff for 45 years and I haven't really improved one bit, not very encouraging. Obviously, what Daniel was talking about was you can't stop your system one uh, approach in his kind of terms. You can't stop your system one reaction, but you can, if you work hard, and it is hard, get system two to kick in and you can uh, consider things uh, more carefully. So in the book, I talk about these very simple uh, shortcuts, uh, not dissimilar to uh, Ulla and Hans Rosling and Anna's book on factfulness, assumption that things are getting better. Uh, that I didn't really talk about social norms, but avoiding assuming you're utterly normal is a very key aspect to this, because we are misled by that. All focusing on the extreme and actively unfilter your world. And in a kind of uh, business world and politics world, you can see some real interesting trends where immersion Eth ethnography and immersion are uh, such growing trends within that kind of market research world and consultancy world because people feel more disconnected from uh, real life and real people. And they're the ones that keep winning awards. Um, it's really interesting trends. We did some trend analysis of what types of projects win the Market Research Society awards uh, each year. And it used to never be ethnography or observational work. And now it's more than half of the ones that win for those types of studies, are the ones that have got some sort of immersion and direct experience, which is not dissimilar to David's points about, you know, actually that deliberative approach, getting people involved, uh, real people involved, is really important. So in terms of the things, the sorts of more policy things, I do think, like Jose, it's, always, it's not at all the, the complete answer, given that uh, we've got so many causes of, of people's misperceptions, but critical statistical news literacy from schools onwards, information environment has changed so much uh, in the past few years, and, and the educational approach to that has changed very little. Um, it's a, such an important issue that there has to be something that we could do better. I do believe, I do a lot for fact-checking networks um, around the world. I do believe we can support fact-checking uh, systemically, preemptively. So they talk about third-generation fact-checking, which is uh, about building it in. First one was just correcting, second one was kind of the lobbying uh, campaigning bit. Third generation elements are, can you build it into the system um, in a more preemptive way, uh, which is possible. Um, fact, uh, one really important point for the communications campaigners among us is this, this sense in which you can either have facts or stories, but you can't have both because uh, that's not how people work. We, we're increasing questions over whether facts and stories are opposites in terms of how you can engage people, the emotional and rational, the extent to which people actually cycle between those, uh, and using both to explain being more powerful than saying there's actually a rational button to push or an emotional button to push. I think that's really um, important. Uh, and then 
uh, sort of more hopefully, I think the thing, the, one of the risks, and Liam will know much more about this than me, and when you present particularly social psychology stuff and biases and heuristics, is people think that they're uh, absolutely inviolate, that there is no chance that, uh, that, these, that you can overcome these types of biases and heuristics and that they apply to everyone equally in all different sorts of situations, when actually they're just averages, average effects and all those types of things. It's not as... Uh, as all-consuming as you might think. So we're not automatons entirely, entirely driven by our biases or our, by our tribal identities and unwilling to change. And then, you know, shame David's not here, but it was the massive untapped potential still, I think, in meaningful deliberation. Um, I think you can see that rising with the Citizens' Assembly in the UK, but also the technology approaches. Um, so people point a lot to v Taiwan as uh, a model in which you can engage people using technology platforms at a bigger scale than a citizens' assembly. Uh, lots of work going on in the UK trying to develop similar platforms to v Taiwan, um, which is a way to reach people through uh, technology. Uh, and then very finally, if I'm all right on time, um, what this means for trust and polarization, just a few reflections on this. I mean, very simple point is it shows how emotional misperceptions um, of measurable realities are. And that does point to why this, this project is so interesting and exciting, because it will be the same for trust. And understanding that better from an effective point of view is going to be really, really valuable, I think. Um, and then it's important to see that how we see realities interacts with our values and identity. Um, that values and identity point is not a simple one-way relationship. It's not that your values and identity change your uh, view of reality, and it's not that your views of reality inform your uh, values and identity. It's the interaction between those two, and it's quite a complex interaction that would be good to understand better. Um, and it's influenced by both how we think and what we're told. There's quite a lot. There's great books that talk a lot about post-truth um, and uh, the kind of information environment, social media, politics. And then there's great books that talk about our biases and heuristics and the kind of social psychology or behavioral science about it. The reality is it's a systemic um, element to it. I mean, I showed you those groups of how we think uh, and what we're told. Uh, and that, that kind of doing it as two buckets like that almost reinforces the problem of these are two separate things. But actually, this is a system. I talk about a system of delusion where people, these things interact and there's feedback loops between them. And that's really important to understand the systemic nature of it. Um, and we need to be aware of our own biases, including on teams like this in some, some ways. I mean, we're pretty uh, rigorous, I'm sure, in our approach to it. But we also have the same focus on being too negative about stuff and think things are going downhill. And we have to just be aware of that from our own perspectives as well. It's often literally not as bad as even we uh, think. Um, but finally, most of all, if you remember, only one thing about this whole presentation. It's that the cat is alive <laughs> and well. Thank you very much. Time for some uh, short questions. Um, uh, starting with you and then you. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm trying to formulate my question. I can't get the image of the cat. There are two journeys that, that you took in your talk. So mm. One was that you moved um, fairly seamlessly from talking about misperceptions of things where there are verifiable statistics, easily verifiable yeah. statistics. So it's very simple to say whether yeah. somebody's factually right or, or, or yeah. wrong. But then you moved later into talking about things that were much more about belief systems or yep. way or political commitments or issues of that kind. So that's one little jump that you know I'd like to have heard a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. And then I think I would challenge the idea that you can move from um, an observation that many of us Get, have misperceptions about very viable facts. Yep. To a claim that things are not as bad as we think. Or to put it another way around, you can say that um, you know, we, um, we're not clearly seeing how things quote, really are. Unquote. And it seems to me that 
things could readily be much worse than we think mm. in many much more complex areas. For example, one that I'm involved in in an advisory capacity to spread throughout the globe of chemicals um, and whose effects on the food <coughs> environment and or human health are not necessarily known. So I, 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 I'm, very, I'm interested in those, um, those flows of, of logic and I have in the back of my mind the idea that in risk studies for mm. decades people were told that they were silly because they were misperceiving risks when in fact what they were doing was looking at those risks on a completely different set of dimensions and um, they were constructing them in much more complex ways. So, I mean, that's not very, that's not very um, an articulate question, but we're getting the cat for that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, I don't know what the question is. I'm sort of, um, well, I, get, I get the point that... I think it's how much read across yeah. you can make from the observation that people don't know pretty straightforward facts, um, which are easily verifiable. Yeah. So I, I suppose I turn the, the question around yeah. um, and ask, but, but so what? I mean, what's yeah, yeah. the read across from mm. that question? Yeah, so I mean, I suppose on that specific point, the read across was that it's not randomly distributed. Your errors are not like uh, some are high, some are low, etc. What you find is that it's biased in a particular direction, which if it was just random, then absolutely you wouldn't have that. And that's slightly where psychophysics comes in, because what psychophysics says it's the study of our psychological response to physical phenomenon, so how bright that light is or how heavy uh, something is. And what they say is actually that um, our responses to things like that are not randomly error. Uh, there is a kind of S-shape pattern to it, which is we uh, overestimate tiny things, small things, then we un underestimate the very big things. We've got this kind of uh, propensity to hedge towards the middle. So what I did, I shared the data with David Landy, who's one of the academics who's most involved in uh, psychophysics, and he applied his models, his kind of S-curve models, to our data. And what that showed is that some of this error is kind of random, is kind of predictable in terms of how a psychophysics model would predict it, that, that some of it's just simple hedging to the middle, but a lot of it isn't um, that, that it is a biased view in their kind of views. So I guess I mean, the, the, answer, the main answer to your question is looking across the hundreds of questions that we've looked at, these are not neutral errors. They are biased perceptions that are in one direction or another. And it's not always negative. That is true. Sometimes we underestimate problems. So obesity is one of them. We have a terrible underestimation of the level of obesity within uh, countries, which shows that we are probably not as focused on it or we are uh, trying to deny the... Um, the importance or the impact of uh, obesity and those types of things. And I think, I mean, like we've done a lot with David Spiegelhalter on risk misperceptions as well. I'm just going to try and get a couple of oh, questions. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, just, uh, long uh, thank, thank you. We can carry on some of the discussions after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that, yeah, if you just introduce yourself. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I am Mario Tarpoli from the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission. Uh, so thank you, Bobby, for the presentation. Uh, so my question is coming from the behavioural economics perspective, mm. as always. And do these surveys, people don't have particular incentive to answer correctly. I mean, they don't have to think about this, don't gain anything. And this relates to this thing that people who believe in conspiracy theories also don't have much incentive to be correct. I mean, if you believe in a flat earth, what is, what is the consequence for your life? Yeah. So my, my question to you would be, did you ever do these surveys with an incentivized question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's no, a really good question. So again, I mean, the thing, just very briefly then, uh, Yes, there have been experiments with that, and accuracy improves with incentives on some questions, not all questions. It is related to how much it's, uh, re the question relates to your underlying values and identity. So the more it is in immersed within your identity, the less the incentives uh, have an uh, impact. And the kind of framework is, uh, that the social psychology uh, would think about it is when you're answering these questions, you have accuracy goals and directional goals. So you're both trying to get the right answer and you're trying to send a message about your views of the world. 
and the incentive increases the incentive for the accuracy goal and decreases the um, kind of directional uh, goal to uh, the, the weight of the directional goal in your in your answer. So there's kind of like a framework to understand why it would work, but also why it doesn't work when it's strongly related to your identities, because that directional goal is more emphasised if it's something that's very important to you, even if you're wrong about it. That makes sense. Uh, okay, colleagues, it's now lunchtime, which is, uh, I'm sure some of you are waiting for it, so I'd just like to thank uh, Bobby again for a very stimulating talk. No worries. Thank you.